Well, hello everybody, this is John Michael Talbot. We are going through a series on the Lover and Beloved. We've been through the whole thing. We're gonna come back for the summary. It's gonna be power packed. Come back and join us. All things are possible with God. Well, howdy folks, this is John Michael. Welcome back. We're gonna be doing a summary of this whole series we've gone through of the lover and the beloved. It's called spousal mysticism, the mysticism of the bride and the bridegroom. In scripture, Jesus is called the bridegroom, the bridegroom. Revelation says that we go to the marriage supper of the lamb, of the lamb, and that he is the groom. So there's this language of intimacy. This is a tough thing for some of us to get a hold of. A lot of us guys, if the church is the bride of Christ, we go, hey, wait a minute, I ain't no bride, bud. <laughs> but it's to bring out not necessarily, um, you know, gender, but it's to bring out intimacy. That our relationship with Jesus Christ is to be so personal and so intimate that the language that best describes it is the, from the earth is the language, the intimacy known between a husband and a wife. It's cool that we're doing this too because we live in a time when people are going to multiple partners and the family unit is breaking down. So one of the cool things is if we want to get our sexuality right, we haven't even focused on that. In my Fire of God series, we talked about the fire of lust and right Christian sexuality and how to express it. So, but if we want to do the right thing rightly, it's got to come from this perspective of this personal love relationship with Jesus Christ. So the idea of the bride and the groom is also going to help us even in our love relationships with our spouses and with our kids and our families. And we're going to reestablish something really fundamental that's breaking down in Western society and is causing our civilization to slowly unravel, unravel. So it's an important analogy. The analogy is found in the history of the church. St. Augustine uses this kind of language of the bride and the groom. St. Bernard of Clairvaux wrote a whole treatise on the Song of Songs. Bernard of Clairvaux was in the 11th century, a reformer in the Western monastic heritage. He was also a great preacher. So a whole series on the Song of Songs. And he began to apply the notion of the bride not only to the church as the bride, but to each individual soul that we become his spouse, his, his bride. Wow. It's not just a corporate reality. It's personal. We know that it also happened with St. Francis of Assisi. He continues with this language a couple of hundred years later. And then right on the heels of St. Francis, the great Franciscan doctor of the church, the seraphic doctor, St. Bonaventure, he uses this language in so much of his teaching, and we went through some of that. We know that St. John of the Cross also really kind of brought this language to a great peak when he talks about the spiritual canticle and the living flame of love and all these wonderful poems that he also did theological treaties based on his poems. But it's all based on this. And we're also seeing with the new evangel evangelicals. So there's lots of non-Catholics and non-Orthodox who are beginning to discover this spousal mysticism because they too are hungry for this intimacy. So it's all about a personal love relationship with Jesus Christ. Pope Francis today, he says, I invite every Christian at this very moment to a renewed personal, personal encounter with Jesus Christ. It's not enough just to go to church. It's not enough, guys, to say, oh yeah, I'm a good Catholic. My wife goes to Mass every Sunday. <laughs> That's not enough. No, it's our decision. That relationship is personal. It is intimate. It is life-changing. 
if it's really in the power of the Spirit. So let's go through some of the stages. The first stage was dialogue. And even before dialogue, there's that initial attraction. Why? You can computer match a bunch of folks. Why do some fall in love and others don't? That's because of grace. He gives us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. His grace working in us, drawing us. No one can come to me unless the Father draws him, says Jesus. Wow. We also move into dialogue. As soon as a good relationship moves beyond that initial attraction, you got to begin to talk. You got to dialogue about objective reality. You know, if one guy says, I want to live on the North Pole, and his gal says, I want to live on the South Pole, they can't cohabitate, they can't get married. That's objective, isn't it? See? So that's an objective truth. And the same thing is true in our relationship with Jesus Christ. In our relationship with Jesus Christ, we need to know the truth, because the truth will set us free, about objective teaching regarding faith, who God is, who Jesus is, who we are to be as church, and morality, how we are to live, what's true, what's false, what's correct, what's incorrect, what's life-giving, and what will eventually begin to take away our life. We know that sin is initially pleasurable, isn't it? That's why we do it. That's why temptation is temptation. But if you keep indulging in that over the period of a life or a, or a society over a period of decades, well, we're going to begin to experience not life, but death, but death. So that initial dialogue is really important. How do we get it? Well, Jesus is the Logos incarnate. He is the Word incarnate. It's not enough just to have a written word. Jesus is the living Word. And He attracted people, and He, 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 he taught them, and He breathed the Spirit on them. And he commissioned leaders and he sent them out. It was a living thing. The word was alive. We call that apostolic tradition. And out of that apostolic tradition, we begin to write some things down that eventually became the New Testament. So the New Testament and the Christian interpretation of the Old Testament, which was in Greek in the early days, these things come out of the church. So there's an inherent link between apostolic tradition and sacred scripture. And we know that these things need to be interpreted. So there is what's called magisterium, or the teaching authority, the apostolic teaching authority of the church. These are so important. And it's also important for us to spend time in scripture study, in scripture reading. Lexio Divina, sacred reading every day. Then we move to love union where the charismatic experience of our faith is alive. Some of us know, you know, we might know the form of godliness, but we don't know the power of godliness. You've got to have that power of the Spirit in your life so that these external things, these objective things, bang, they come to life. There's not only truth, there is love, love. Jesus says, you will know the truth, the truth will set you free. I will send you another advocate, a comforter, who will teach you all truth. I will come to you. So Jesus himself is within us through the power of the Spirit, and Jesus is teaching us about his way inside. This power of the Spirit is rapturous. Do we allow ourselves to be caught up, caught up, enraptured in the Spirit of God? To be taken up, out, you know, it's emotional, folks. It's not just all up here in the head. It's got to drop to the heart. See? We don't want to have emotionalism, but we want to be enthusiastic in theos, in God. See, so you got to allow your feelings, your emotions to get into the act, not just your head. So we experience all the gifts of the Spirit, tongues and healings and prophecies and miraculous power, all these wonderful things. They begin, in fact, to come up in our life. I'm going to do a series, I hope, later on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and we'll go through them one by one. So the other thing is, is you get wrapped when the Spirit is, you just get wrapped. John of Alverna was in the middle of Mass. He was a priest, and he got in the middle of the consecration, and the, that Jesus was right there with him, enwrapped him, and he went into a rapture, out of himself. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. That's a gift of, and resting in the Spirit. The early Franciscans, the Spirit of God would overcome them. 
And it says they, they would fall asleep. They would fall down like dead men. They'd fall out on the ground. So all of the gifts and the phenomena of the Holy Spirit, they didn't just start happening in 1904 and 1906 in Topeka, Kansas, and Hot Springs, Arkansas, and Azusa Street out here in California. No, there's a continuancy that goes all the way, a continuum that goes all the way back to the apostles. Now we have to say, if you say, I will accept any gift except, I'll do anything except speak in tongues, except rest in the Spirit, except, is except acceptable in your language with God? If except becomes acceptable in your language with Jesus, you're cutting off the power of the Spirit in your life. Let's come back here. We're going to look at the further stages. I'm having a blast. I hope you guys are too. All things are possible with God. Spirit, Lord of life, from the clear celestial height, thy pure beaming radiance give. Come thou far. treasures to endure. Come thou light of all that live. Many sante spiritus, many sante of our guilt away. Welcome back, everybody. We're going to continue on. We have really four different stages, and then we experience the cross in all those stages. Dialogue, that power of love union with Jesus, afterglow, and then ministry evangelization in the daily life of the church. Right now, we're going to look at number three. We're going to look at the afterglow of the contemplative life. A lot of us like to read the scripture. We like to get excited about Jesus, but we haven't allowed ourselves to go on to that quiet being with Jesus, just learning how to be with the one who is. And so we don't have that inner peace. Oh, we might have joy, but we don't have peace. Do you have that peace? So that no matter what comes in your life, you're going to be at peace. Well, to, to really enter into this contemplative silence, to find this communion and solitude, you've got to set aside a time and place. You've got you to go 20, 30 minutes a day maybe twice a day, undisturbed. Learn how to silence your body. Learn how to silence your thoughts. And then a funny thing, your emotions are going to get silent too. And you're going to have this peace. Your mind will never stop. It always moves, but it focuses. So we become 
Hezekiah, sacred stillness like a pond that settles down. When the pond settles, see, all of the agitation and the mud and the mire that's up in the water, it sinks to the bottom. Now the water is clear. The soul becomes clear. You can see what God is up to because you've experienced that contemplation. The same thing is true with a husband and wife. Using this analogy, after you've con consummated your marriage in rapturous love union, well, you learn how to just be with each other, don't you? Isn't that cool? To learn how to just be and to just bask in communion with each other. That happens with Jesus too. See, sometimes we're just not finding that depth and then we wonder why we don't have peace and we wonder why we don't have balance in our church, in our ministry, in our family, in our life. It brings you an inner stability, an inner stability. St. Bonaventure says you have to die and pass over into this place of rest, place of rest. So look for that contemplative peace. Learn how to enter into that afterglow with Jesus so that you can grow in maturity. Now, once you get this in your life, this is powerful. Once you get this balance, this depth, now you have something to share. You wake up the next morning after you've dialogued, had consummating union, after you've entered into afterglow, you wake up the next morning, you have to take care of the kids. Because <laughs> if you've done this before with Jesus, you got pregnant. You got fat with the Spirit of God. You begin to have love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and mildness and generosity and chastity and faith. Against such there is no law, St. Paul says. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their flesh with his passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit's lead. Galatians 6. Five, excuse me. So, yeah, isn't that cool? So, we, we get pregnant and we give birth to kids. We give birth to, but guess what? They're called Christians, Christianas, little Christ. But little kids, you know, they do funny stuff. And you gotta take care of them, you gotta feed them. Then they throw up. <laughs> you gotta clean them up. Well, that's life in the church. See, so our ministry begins to overflow, or excuse me, our union with Christ begins to overflow into life in the church. Our contemplation, our charismatic ecstatic union, our study overflows into ministry and it starts in the church. Isn't that cool? But it's hard work, isn't it? It's hard work. You have to raise the family. Well, Jesus gives us a few things. He gives us the Great Commission. Go, make disciples of all the nations. And in a sense, that was given to the apostles. We know from Luke chapter uh, 9, I believe it is, that the apostles were given especially a ministry, the 12. But we know from Luke 10 that that ministry was also given to the disciples who went before him. Every place that Jesus was going to go, they went and they prepared the way. They were his PR and marketing firm, baby. <laughs> How about that? So all of us are out there preparing the way for Jesus. As we go around the world, we minister. We, you know, we're, we're, we're heralding the way of Jesus. So it's for all of us. We also know that... Uh, this happens in a, in a particular way, in a particular way. It happens in our speech. Scripture says, always be ready to give an answer to anybody who asks you. Guess what? If, and, and, and your life is a letter of the Spirit, known and read by all people. What do you, what? you are a gospel. You are a euangelion. You, meaning good, and Galeon from Angelos, messenger. So you are a good messenger of a good message. But that message is being proclaimed all through your life. When you go to Target and Costco and Walmart, when you, when you go to work, when you drop your kids off at school, when you do all this stuff, you are proclaiming the gospel. You are preparing the way for Jesus in the way you live. And what about your face? Is Jesus in your heart? 
please inform your face. I had a nun say that to me once. She says, is Jesus in your heart? I said, yes. She said, please inform your face, John Michael. We have to have the joy of the gospel, see? So we are evangelizing everywhere we go. Are you an evangelist? It's one of the gifts of the Spirit, one of the ministry gifts. We're all called to be evangelists, to bring the joy. The word joy in Pope Francis is, uh, you know, he wrote the joy of the gospel. The word joy in scripture is kara, kara. It's at the root of charis, which means gift, which is at the root of charismatic. So if you're a charismatic, you gotta be filled with joy. It's also at the root of charismai, which means forgiveness. If you don't forgive people, it bind, you know, you bind and loose by forgiving. It's not only given to the bishops and the pope, it's given to us too. You either bind people or you loose them. You free them to follow Christ. And when you don't free people to follow Christ, you bind yourself up too, don't you? And then you lose your joy. There is no kara at the middle of charismai. <laughs> and it's at the heart of another word, Eucharist. Eucharist. Is there joy in your Eucharist? Are people leaving your parish because they don't find engagement with Christ and joy in your Eucharist? They go down the street, they say, ah, I know it's not quite as deep as rich, but at least they're engaged. Don't blame the people down there for stealing your people. No. So, so stir up the joy of the gospel in your parish, in your liturgy, in your life. Now here's the deal. A lot of times we think that evangelization, evangelizing, oh, if we get the right program in, if we can just get the right, let's get the liturgy right. Get, let's get the rules right. Well, I'm all for good liturgy and I'm all for good rubrics, don't get me wrong, but rubrics ain't gonna save you. They're just signposts that point the way, like a road map. Sometimes we get so obsessed about the road map, we miss the turnoff. Sometimes we make a God of the gifts of God and we miss God by misusing his gifts. How about that? See, that's the way it is. So. It's not enough just to have a good program. It's not enough just to have a good roadmap. You gotta make the journey. You gotta get off at the exit so that you can accomplish what it's there for, to have that union with Christ. So a program is great, but it's like being pregnant. You know, you can be impregnated and have no program, you're still gonna give birth to a child. It may be a little more painful, a little more awkward, but you're gonna give birth. If you're not impregnated, all of the prepared childbirth programs in the world, you can sit there and you're not gonna have a baby. You're just gonna hyperventilate. Sometimes that's what we're doing in our churches. We're just hyperventilating. But if you have impregnation and a good childbirth program, now you can give birth more easily. And that's what we wanna do. So are you impregnated by God? by the Spirit, I pray that you are. So these, these, these stages are so important. Attraction and dialogue, the good teaching, really. Rapturous union with Jesus Christ, our spouse, consummating the union. Good contemplation in afterglow. And lastly, reaching out in evangelization to the whole world. I pray you have that. Let's take a moment and pray. I want you to pray that you're gonna have this balance in your life with Christ. Jesus, fill us, call us, teach us, impregnate us. Help us to give birth to your children on the face of this earth through our life, through the bride and through the bride of the church. Help us to give birth and bring forth many children in your name. And we pray this in Jesus' name. I love you guys. All things are possible with God. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. And my spirit exalts my Savior, for He has looked with mercy on 
舞台